Good morning. Uh, my name is Ying Tam, and for those of you that don't know me, I'm the uh, Managing Director of Health here at Mars, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to Mars Mornings. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, we host Mar Mars Mornings as an opportunity for the entrepreneur to tell their story, their trials and tribulations, the twists and turns they've taken on their journey. And today we have Newtopia, and you're going to hear about some of those twists and turns uh, really great learnings for those of us that are on an entrepreneurial journey, but also informative for everyone else. Uh, so before I get to the introductions, I do want to say, you know, that Newtopia is, you know, interesting. They're, they're tackling the whole idea around behavioral change, which I think is a fascinating topic. And also, uh, Jeff is about to IPO, one of those twists. So anyone who has a check, you know, he's going to be up here, you know, with his hat out. Just kidding. Okay, so today we have Jeff Ruby who's the CEO of Newtopia, and he's going to talk about his journey and the Newtopia story. Newtopia is an interesting story, and Jeff has taken some unique paths to advance his company. So a little bit about Jeff and Newtopia before I invite him up to the stage. Newtopia is a precision health company for habit change and disease prevention. They focus on individuals who are pre-chronic. So pre-chronic obesity, pre-type 2 diabetes, pre-heart disease, you kind of get the picture. And to get to know them really well socially, behaviorally, genetically, and to design specific, meaningful human and digital experiences to inspire and achieve sustainable habit change. And Jeff will tell you much more about that. Jeff Ruby is the CEO and is a health innovator with an extensive track record in preventative health. Prior to Notopia, Jeff was co-founder and COO of Cleveland Clinic Canada, co-founder and COO of Life Screening Centers, a cancer screening and prevention company, and co-founder and head of operations, I see a pattern here, of uh, Genetic Diagnosis, an early stage biotech company. Please join me in welcoming Jeff to the stage. Wow, can you hear me? So that's perfect, good morning. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Thank you for joining uh, on a rainy autumn morning. <laughs> sort of, sorry, I think we're all getting a little ready for spring. Um, so it's, it's a kind of exciting to be here. I, I, this has been a, a really interesting journey and uh, Ying just did a part of my introduction for me on what Newtopia is, but I think what probably you're all more interested in is how we got here and, and uh, where's the story behind this precision health approach to disease prevention and habit change. And, um, and, and it's a kind of a personal one. So I'm probably the most unlikely person in this room, not knowing who all of you are, um, with zero background in health science, zero background in health and wellness. I don't have a background in nutrition or exercise or behavioral health. Uh, in fact, um, I did a JD MBA and thought I wanted to be a corporate securities lawyer. Um, and I became one. Uh, I did a big Bay Street firm around the corner from here. And unfortunately, the vocational fit just wasn't right. And I knew it almost immediately. And I had um, a bit of a crisis of, uh-oh, what am I going to do? And so I resigned my position as an associate on a Monday and had three whole days to figure out what to do next. Because on the Thursday of that week, uh, my dad called me. And he had been uh, just uh, diagnosed with abdominal cancer at the age of 54. And it was my very rude introduction to what I now call our sick care system. Prior to that, just quite frankly, I had no reason to look at health. Um, it just didn't hit my radar screen at all. And it was really through my dad's experience that I came to this almost sort of horrific realization that health care has very little to do with keeping healthy people healthy. In fact, every incentive that's driven is toward illness. Everyone gets paid. Every building gets built. Every driver is toward fixing sickness. And I'm a sort of person that realizes where energy goes, efforts flow. And so we almost need people to get sick for this system to work. And I just think that is fundamentally backward. And I think one day, history is going to look back, I think that day is coming soon, to say this is totally backward. Because what we don't do is we don't take care of each other and ourselves to avoid that sick care system. In fact, that's left up to us. And by and large, we're guessing pretty wildly at what to do. We're listening to whoever the next thought leader is, Dr. Oz, Oprah, Goop, our 
our, our partner, our doctor, quite frankly, they're all guessing. And I was just struck by that through my dad's experience that we've got this all wrong. The second major lesson really came uh, at Princess Margaret, uh, just across the street. I was sitting with my dad, his first appointment. First question to the oncologist was, you know, Doc, how the hell did I get this? Uh, no family history, came out of the blue, he's 54 years old, seemingly healthy. And the oncologist, I'll never forget, came out with, well, Mr. Ruby, I think a lot of this has to do with some unlucky genes and your lifestyle choices. Now, I have to admit, in that moment, many of you may be nodding your heads and understand that really well. I had no clue what he was talking about. My business degree and law degree did not give me the perspective on genes, lifestyle, cancer. But I knew enough that I probably shared some of those genes. And I knew enough that I had no idea what healthy lifestyle choices meant for me, despite a pretty good family doctor that I went to every year, a gym membership that I actually used at the time, uh, and a good benefits program through the law firm I was at. And so I had this second moment of abject terror, which was, oh boy, if he doesn't know, and he's here, and I don't know, and I easily could be, I bet you none of us have a clue what this confluence of genes, lifestyle, to stay healthy is, and also, how do we inspire and motivate people to truly stay healthy to avoid the sick care system? And so I did what every good lawyer does. <laughs> I wanted to fix it. And so I've been doing that for 20 years now. Uh, through this journey, Ying told you a little bit more about it. But um, I have this itch, which is, how do we make health care about keeping healthy people healthy as a first priority? And then when that fails, and only if that fails, should what we call health care kick in as a second step. Unfortunately, we don't have the first step in place at all, and that's really what Newtopia is all about in this journey I've been on is. So let's fast forward. And, and by the way, never thought I'd be a serial prevention entrepreneur. Uh, never thought these would all connect. They make sense in retrospect. But when I was on this journey, a few months after that oncologist appointment, I had this opportunity to join a group of scientists from U of T who were interested in uh, trying to commercialize a new genetic diagnostic technology. Remember, zero background in genetics, zero background in health sciences. I'm a pretty good speaker. I thought I could raise money and help them design a business plan. So I joined as a co-founder thinking, here's a good way to learn about the genetic side. And boy, did I ever learn. I also learned we were 10 years too early to personal genetic testing. And uh, three years into that project, we'd raised buckets of money, lots of R&D going on. Uh, but my dad passed away at 57. And uh, I wanted to get closer to cancer. And so I left that opportunity and moved into my second venture, which was called Life Screening Centers. It was a partnership with a group of oncologists and surgeons who were really frustrated by the state of or lack of gold standard diagnostic availability but also no information being provided to individuals doing that screening on what to do to reduce the risk in between. So we were helping individuals with uh, you know, breast cancer, colorectal cancer prevention, um, prostate cancer prevention, matching up the best of gold standard diagnostics with the best of preventive advice. And it was through that project I started to really fall in love with what I call the holy trinity of prevention. It's the right combination of nutrition, plus exercise, plus behavioral and mental well-being. When you put those three together, you've got this really great cocktail of lifestyle management. And so that's what we were doing. We were providing the diagnostic, providing the preventive advice. I started to learn how to straddle the public and private side of health here in Canada. Really interesting. We were doing great. And as we were looking to scale across the country, I had a fluke, and I mean fluke meeting, with the international development team at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. Uh, they had partnered with Canyon Ranch in the U.S. for a best of health and mel uh, wellness model. And they were interested in attracting Canadians to that. And they were trying to figure out how to do it. And originally they thought insurance was going to be the way to go. And so I kind of scoffed and said, no, not a chance. If you want to be Canadian, you've got to lay down roots in Canada and be Canadian. And um, <laughs> they actually took me up on it and said, well, how would we do that? And so that was the genesis of Cleveland Clinic Canada. Um, and it was uh, a real interesting opportunity to roll life screening centers into that project, but also spend an awful lot of time touring around some of the best health and wellness institutes in the world. Spent a lot of time at the Cleveland Clinic, of course, places like the Mayo Clinic, Duke, Hopkins, trying to understand what that integrative model looked like. Spent a lot of time roughing it at places like Canyon Ranch and Miraval and Pritikin, understanding what they were doing on the uh, health and wellness side. And we brought all of that programming and expertise to what we delivered uh, and continue to deliver here in Canada uh, at Cleveland Clinic. Um, 
with one little problem, and it's not a problem so much for what they're doing, it was a problem for me. I realized that you know, within a short period of time, I built a really big ivory tower, literally in an ivory tower, and we were really just servicing the top 1% of high net worth executives and kind of rich people. Nothing wrong with that, except they've got tons of those uh, resources and services available. And I started wondering to myself, well, what does everyone else get? You know, what's, what's available to the mass market? And I was a little horrified to realize that it wasn't even close. At best, what's available had been kind of the silo approaches, the diet only or the exercise only, not much mindfulness or meditation at that time, it is now, but even there, these silo approaches, um, which are lovely business models, they're shit health models, because they're built around a hamster wheel, they're built to have you succeed for a short time and fail, and get your sort of dopamine dripping that you need to use them for a bit, tap off, use them for a bit, tap off, and again, wonderful for their cash flow, terrible for someone's health and confidence. And so I thought, wow, Here's an opportunity to take all these lessons learned from my time in genetics, my time in cancer screening and prevention, my time in general health prevention, um, and build something for the mass market. And that's really where Newtopia uh, came from. And I had a little bit of funds from my takeout from Cleveland to seed it. And so what I'd love to do is just give you a little bit more insight into the Newtopia journey because um, while all of that sounds like it was all put together, trying to figure out how to actually implement disease prevention at scale to the mass market is not as easy as I had thought. Um, and so there's been a journey, and we've got a couple of investors here who've been on that journey with me and can attest uh, by the number of times I had to ask for more checks that this has not been an easy run. Um, and even still, it continues to be an interesting journey. But where Newtopia started uh, was actually with a direct-to-consumer approach. I had this sort of naive belief that if we just introduced this integrative, best of practice, world-class approach, working at the high ends of the market, that that would be um, welcomed by everyone who at best had the diet or exercise uh, and or um, you know, wellness approach. And boy, was I wrong. Uh, and here's why I was wrong. Uh, we learned two questions, and so we spent three years, the first three years of Newtopia's life, trying out different um, direct-to-consumer preventive uh, approaches. We, we worked in retail. Uh, online, physician referrals, hospital referrals, uh, network marketing. We actually had our participants uh, do this for a little while, and we failed in each one of them. Fair, fortunately, we failed quickly, fairly capital efficiently, but what I learned were, were two incredibly valuable lessons, and for anyone here who's trying to deliver health services to the consumer, take heed, because I've written a book, it's called The Checkbook, and I understand this really well. One, individuals do not invest in disease prevention for themselves. As contrary as that may think, people are not gonna spend money today out of their genes to prevent things like cancer or diabetes or heart disease or stroke. They're just not gonna do it. We are all uh, the same in that we like immediate gratification. What we spend on, we wanna see impact on right away. And so we are gonna spend on aesthetic services. We're gonna spend money to look good and feel good in this moment. And what it meant is that we were forced in those three years to become an aesthetic weight loss company. Effectively, we were pushed to help individuals look good in their March break uh, bathing suit, their wedding photo, uh, or you know, whatever was right in front of them. But the trick was, as soon as we did that, everyone who worked with us wanted to forget we existed. We were, <laughs> we were like a guilty pleasure, we helped, and then we didn't exist. Um, and so that was a real problem to delivering real disease prevention uh, at scale. And then the second major lesson is don't uh, underestimate the power of a consumer brand. There's a reason why Oprah and Weight Watchers are together. There's a reason why celebrities endorse um, companies uh, and, and athletes are all in front of uh, athletic companies. It's because people also want to buy that aspirational brand or that aspiration from a brand. And we didn't have one. And we didn't have the money to build it. And so I kind of realized that the direct-to-consumer vision, while all these routes were gonna fail. But this really interesting thing was going on, even though it cost us way too much to acquire those participants, we were having amazing results for the three or 4,000 participants that we had worked with. And so it wasn't a question of whether or not the mouse trap wasn't working, it was. It was the distribution economics that we couldn't figure out. And so 
we did this humble little pivot. I love that word, pivot. It sounds so elemental. It's like, hey, we're just going to turn. Don't mistake it. We stopped the company. We restarted the company. I fired the team. I hired the team. I raised a lot more money. Um, and we, we moved to an enterprise model, really believing or having a thesis that if we just start working with employers and insurers who already have a relationship with those individuals, we could get rid of the branding component uh, and try to go after the motivation to drive prevention. So that was the thought, that was the pivot, uh, and uh, best decision we ever made. But another bump, we tried to do it in Canada. And again, I'm, I'm a proud Canadian, no disrespect, but this is a monster impossible place to innovate. Um, and Canadian employers, while wonderful, have very little motivation to innovate and more importantly invest in their employees who are at risk. They just don't feel the financial pain. Um, and so when you have non-economic rationale for driving programs of this kind, it's a real, real challenge. So we spent a year working with some of the largest employers and insurers in Canada and it was a total disaster. They had no idea who they were serving it up to. We had literally triathletes versus other, you know, it was just a, a total mishmash. And we had no signal to noise ratio, and it was just confusing. And so, by the way, I should say, when direct to consumer failed, really considered giving up. When Canada failed, really considered giving up. And I did something interesting. I sent myself to Boston to something called Health 2.0. I had a speaking opportunity as we were failing in the Canadian direction and um, gave a talk similar to the one I'm giving now on precision health, this idea of habit change and using sort of this genomics background to do it. And this really amazing thing happened. After the talk, I, I had a tap on my shoulder from the team at Aetna, um, big US uh, health insurer. And they said, what you're doing is really, really fascinating. Would you be interested in talking to our team a little bit more about collaborating? So I'm like, <laughs> you don't have to ask me twice. Of course, that took nine months for that next meeting to happen. Um, and so what, what it ended up happening and what was going on in the background that I didn't realize is that Aetna had been investing in a big data tool to identify um, metabolic syndrome risk, which is pre-chronic disease risk, amongst their 40 million members. They'd hired Accenture to run a global market search, and they pretty much looked at every major platform out there uh, in terms of what they were doing and whether or not they were successful. And unbeknownst to us, uh, Newtopia was in this beauty contest and came out on top. Um, and so when we learned that we had an opportunity, we thought, great, let's start selling. Not so fast. What Aetna had in mind is, let's test this now for three years in a large-scale randomized control trial. And so just imagine that board meeting. Everybody, we've got a contract with Aetna. Here's the problem. For three years, we can't do anything but work on this group of individuals. And success is going to mean we have an opportunity to prove it. Failure means <laughs> you guys have funded three full years of this. Um, and I will have to say, I give my board full credit. They saw the opportunity as much as I did, and we went for it. And so Aetna took just under 3,000, 2,835 of their own at-risk employees, and we separated a group into a participant group, 1890, 945 into a control group. It was fully done um, the way a drug is proved out, double-blind placebo-controlled trial, and we published our results in peer-reviewed journals. And what it did is it was the best decision we ever made. It happened, fortunately, because now we have clinical evidence of the efficacy of what we do of the health risk reduction at the end of 12 months and 24 months, of the cost savings and reductions at the end of 12 and 24 months, and also of the ROI we can generate for employers and insurers. Um, and so all of that was in a three-year bet. And what it led to was another major uh, learning and another major pivot. Um, the first, so we published our results. Aetna wanted to roll out across their enterprise. That's 50,000 employees. Wow, fantastic. Aetna also said, let's start to be a distribution partner for you. Wow, fantastic. I literally thought at that point, all right, going to hang this up. We're made in the shade. And then the next start sort of lessons began, which is, so now we figured out the distribution approach. We figured out who the target should be. We're going to work with US insurers and employers who've got full economic incentive to drive this. And now the selling approach had to be figured out, because the next lesson was, Having other people sell for you while it looks good is a total curse. Because what we didn't know at the time is that Aetna 
while I love them as partners, were really looking at us as a bright, shiny ball of innovation. They didn't care that we were Canadian. They just cared that they were able to promote this fantastic genetic innovation for disease prevention. Actually, they didn't really care if they sold it, didn't care if they closed it. They just wanted to make sure that their customers knew that they had it. Well, that's cool for them. Not so good when we're assuming that they're going to close business, we're going to grow our revenues, grow our participant base. And so it took us one cycle to realize that what we thought was going to happen didn't happen, um, and that we better make a change quick. And so that change came, which was really taking control of our own horse and our own destiny and selling direct. Uh, and so selling direct meant learning how does the US infrastructure work in terms of employers and insurers buying? Who's bringing that innovation to employers and insurers? What's the innovation network look like? And so we very quickly became masters of understanding that um, like any new approach, there are early adopters and innovators that are looking for and, and wanting to you know, sort of test and prove out new innovation. But they're looking for it from very specific players. And so there's a group uh, tier in the US, not as much here, they're called benefit consultants. Uh, it's groups like Aon, Willis Towers Watson, Mercer, um, and, uh, and there's sort of tier one and tier two players. But they are very, very important in the ecosystem of identifying innovation, but also bringing that innovation forward to their customers, in this case, employers and insurers. And so we struck up a relationship with them. I should say I hired a full sales team. We spent a boatload, fired the entire sales team because they didn't do anything, because we didn't realize that we really just had to speak to the innovation brokers. This wasn't about knocking on cold doors. So another lesson learned there. Um, and so we, we kind of started to figure out in another sales cycle how to do this. Um, and right now, what we're doing is really leveraging the innovation infrastructure in the US, um, the innovation brokers, the benefit consultants, even players like Aetna, even though we're not having them directly sell us, we're having them introduce us to um, you know, the kind of companies that would be interested. And so this really interesting thing has happened in two years of commercial activity. We're now working with some of the largest employers and insurers in the US, not just Aetna, and as you've heard in the news, CVS has acquired Aetna. So we've had the opportunity to grow from their 50,000 to what is now 300,000 collective employees. Uh, we work with JP Morgan Chase, they have 165,000 employees, but with their collaboration with Haven, that's Amazon, Berkshire, and JP Morgan, that's 1.2 million employees. We work with Accenture, they have 400,000 global employees. We work with Wellcare, who've just been acquired by Centene, um, hundreds of thousands of collective employees. And so two things have happened. As we've learned how to sell direct and own our own ship, and as we've grown into this innovator early adopter cycle, this FOMO um, has appeared, where as our name becomes greater and greater, other employers are asking themselves, especially in the same categories, uh-oh, what's this Newtopia thing? We'd better have it. And we're getting invited to more and more tables uh, to talk uh, and to present and to pitch. And that's been really, really exciting. And uh, we see some huge scale ahead, which is one of the motivations for this whole go public. Um, we were literally invited to a meeting in New York a few weeks ago when um, some of the largest employers in the world looked at me and said, if we hand you our population, can you handle that growth? And they were dead serious. And I was dead serious saying, yes, the only way we can is because of this direct to, you know, to public route where we can access capital you know, from around any market in the world and grow to whatever size you need. And that's been a, a really interesting dynamic for us. So here's where we are. How do we differentiate? And I think one of the other really important tools, and I think this is a, val a really valuable lesson, is that we've got this incredible differentiation. And I would say largely it's because we came from here. And so there are two schools of thought on prevention, um, what we do, <laughs> literally, and what our competitors do. And so what our competitors do, which is advocated by the Center of Disease Control, the CDC in the United States, is they believe that prevention should all be about building up knowledge and education. In diabetes, 100 million Americans are at risk. By the way, we're not that far behind in our own scale. Um, it's the thought that if we put a course together, a curriculum, um, it's 16 weeks. Let's think of it as lifestyle 101, the right eating, the right exercise, the right uh, behavior change. Then by teaching that curriculum at the end of six weeks, the knowledge that we've built up should be enough to change behavior. And that's literally the way that they're hoping to prevent 100 million people from getting 
uh, from you know, being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. So you can probably hear in my voice I'm a little skeptical because I don't know about all of you, I think we've all been to school for a long time. I don't know how many of you took a college course that changed your life and your behavior on one of the hardest things to change. I have never in all of my time had that experience. And I think the CDC's diabetes prevention program is gonna epically fail because I think like the entire education system, they've got it wrong. It's not about knowledge and education to change behavior. It's about changing habits and confidence. And ultimately where Newtopia goes a totally different direction and we're literally on our own is by taking this precision health approach, by focusing one by one by one and focusing on a one size fits one approach, we're not trying to build education and knowledge. We're trying to change habits and we're trying to build confidence. And our outcomes, if you were to look at them graphed up, is we see clinical outcomes that are significant at 12 months to reduce all risk factors, things like waist circumference, blood pressure, blood glucose, triglycerides, cholesterol, all move in the right direction. But that's our starting point. And in fact, if it just stayed there, I think we failed. I don't think the hard part is getting to a short-term outcome. I think the hard part is getting to an outcome that's meaningful that grows over time. And a habit change approach sort of sees that growth. In a cycle, it's exactly what we see. We see a doubling at the end of 24 months in our outcomes, continued growth uh, at the end of 36 months. Yet, the knowledge and education approach really isn't about that at all. They see short-term results at the end of 16 weeks because it's all been rigged and engineered to get you there. But then as soon as you get there, the line starts to recede almost immediately. So too the risks come back, so too the costs come back. And so one of the reasons we've been able to differentiate is because we thought differently. Our US peers, who I know and respect greatly, all grew up in the US, all grew up under the CDC rationale, all grew up under the gospel of we'd better take this standard and apply it. And because we didn't, quite frankly, I never even considered the CDC when we built Newtopia. But because of that, we are so highly differentiated, there isn't anyone else doing it the way we do, and it gets us to every table, and we've never lost a competitive bid. If I get to the table with any of these companies, we win, because it's just so much more elegant. We have the proof, we've spent the time uh, to you know, put the evidence together, and there isn't a company that's seen us that doesn't want to take that approach. And that's a pretty enviable position, but it's also an enviable spot for Canadians to really think that thinking different, being different, not growing up in that ecosystem, actually provides massive strategic advantage. And so it's gonna to lead to another point I wanted to make. We've come on this journey, and we're sitting here in the, one of the towers of innovation in Canada, and I'm here to say that if you're building a health technology company or a health startup that's built for Canada, I think you're thinking too small. In fact, I know you're thinking too small. As I said before, I love Canada, really want our uh, approach to work, and I joke that I, um, and for, let's, I think generationally this will make sense, I feel like we're Shania Twain playing to Deerhurst right now in Canada. <laughs> no one has a clue who the hell we are, but as soon as we get to Vegas, baby, the doors are gonna open, and all of a sudden everyone's gonna embrace, whoa, Newtopia built in Canada is one of us. And by the way, anyone who's doing this as well, as well in Canada, Canadian companies have to make it somewhere else big before they're embraced back home. It's just a Canadian thing. It's like, it's like beaver tails and hockey here. It's just one of those things. And so I would really say there's nothing wrong with building for Canada. In fact, we need innovation. But if you're just planning to do it across 13 regional um, you know, ministries and trying to get employers and insurers who have very little motivation to buy um, for 36 million people, I have one customer in Aetna with more with 40 million customers in one sales aggregation that blows this entire country away, and I've got one relationship to manage instead of 13. So just consider, think bigger. If your idea and your concept can't commercialize and grow across North America, figure out how it can, because I think you're rate limiting yourself, your ideas, your time, and your opportunity if you're just focused here. I think it's gotta be everywhere. Um, next point, and you know, maybe last, and then I'd love to potentially open it up for a lot of questions, because you've heard enough from me, is there are three key things that I hope you've heard uh, in what I've, what I've been saying today. And I'm not some special person. I'm not some born entrepreneur. I think that is a total myth. I didn't have a you know, lemonade stand when I was four years old, hawking. You know, it's great for those people who do. In fact, I never even aspired to be an entrepreneur. But what I have, 
um, and what I believe is really required is there's got to be some passion. There's got to be something that wakes you up every single day to ask, why am I doing this? Why am I building this? How am I going to attract a team around me? How am I going to attract investors? Why are people going to believe that I or you have the answer uh, to building something that's going to change the world? And if there's no passion there, let me guarantee, in 20 years, I've failed more than I've succeeded. I've lost, I've, I've raised over $100 million in capital. That's all other people's money across those four businesses. Some of them went really well, some of them didn't go well. Um, and one thing I can assure you is that things are going to go wrong before they go right. And without the passion to figure out what it means so that you can't, you've got to you know, go back to your partner and say, honey, there's no salary for three years, or we can't send our kids to summer camp, or we can't you know, buy a new house ever, uh, or even afford a house, um, you better have some passion to be able to be up front on that conversation. You better have a wonderful partner, whether it's the person in your life, the friends around you, the mentors and directors that will guide you along, because these journeys are really hard. There's a lot of romanticism about entrepreneuring these days, um, and I think it's, very, it's, it's a great thing. But boy, you just have to make sure that infrastructure is there, uh, because this is not the easiest thing to do. There are, far easy, or, there are easier ways to make a buck, I can assure you, not easier ways to change the world, but having that passion is really important. Surrounding yourself um, with the right individuals, uh, the right mentors, the right um, people who can, who've been there, especially those who have failed, so important. Uh, I've got, I purposely look for individuals who have done incredibly well, but if all they've done is do well, they scare the hell out of me because their time to fail, I don't want that on my time. So I really love the ones that have won and failed because then they've got perspective and then they have something to really offer that's valuable, not just capital, but advice uh, and, and guidance that's really important. So look for those when you're surrounding yourself with individuals to help you along this journey. And then the third, which I think is probably the most important characteristic, is you just can't give up. Ever, and I mean ever. The only way to play this game, the only way to win and to change the world is you have to be in the game. You can't run out of money, ever. You can't give up. You have to accept that, you're, that failure is lesson. There is no failure. And that ultimately, if you give up, you're not gonna change anything. And so persistence, grit, never giving up in the face of what is almost <laughs> insurmountable adversity. Um, which comes at you every single day, is the key criteria. And when you put those three things together, passion, surround yourself with the right individuals, never give up, I think there's uh, amazing roots and amazing things that we can achieve. And the only thing holding us back in this room from doing that, quite frankly, is us. Uh, and, and this belief that somehow what we're doing is only applicable to this building, this province, this country. Think bigger, uh, do bigger, do more. Um, and uh, I think we'll all be incredibly successful. And with that, thanks for coming out this morning. I'd love to take some questions. Thanks, Jeff. That was really awesome, really passionate. We'll start over here. Hi, uh, my name is Joseph. And first of all, Jeff, I really thank you for your time and uh, proud of Shuley alumni. And uh, my question is, uh, as you've been sort of a journey as an entrepreneur, like, uh, do you find yourself sort of difficulty getting funded or raising the capital? What's your experience? What are like uh, things can be better? Because uh, I'm my background in politics, so I'm from like sort of government side, public policy, and I hear a lot of entrepreneurs, especially in Canada, complains about like the lack of capital access. Like they have to go to U.S. or something else in order to fund their business. So, what's your thoughts on how we can be improved? Yeah. Um. It's a, it's a good question, and I, I would really, I think that victim um, scenario is, there's a lot of money. <laughs> there's a lot of money out there. There have been a lot of successful entrepreneurs that are looking to angel invest. There are a lot of institutions that want to play that bridge role in growth. There are venture capital, private, um, public market, private equity, U.S. Canadian sources. I, I think it's, I, I would put that more on the entrepreneur to, to just go figure it out. Good ideas get funded. 
uh, and, and beware, they're not good ideas. Good entrepreneurs get funded. What, what you're being funded for at the beginning is your idea, <laughs> no one cares about your idea, quite frankly, because everyone who's funding realizes that what you think you're gonna do is not what you're gonna end up doing. They're funding the jockey, not, you know, they're, they're funding who's gonna ride that horse, who's gonna be there and figure out through the adversity. And I think, um, I think there's plenty of capital available. There's no question there are challenges. And so looking strictly here for it, um, you know, we funded through a combination of Canadian to American, we're back to Canada, and so you've got to be flexible in moving around. But I, I just think great ideas and most importantly, passionate entrepreneurs get funded um, because everyone's looking for and wants to be part of how we change the health of the planet. And if you're part of that solution, then, then you'll find and attract capital. Yeah, I, th I think it's. Um, I think you just got nowhere to go. Um, and so, I, one one warning I will say is, I think um, a lot of uh, folks who get started love to run into the arms of venture capital early. <laughs> Beware, um, venture capital is not your friend. Uh, venture capital is out for a return, generally in a pretty short you know time horizon for their LPs. I've actually never taken big venture capital just because I don't think health and health tech is rocket fuelable um, in so far as it's really hard to scale. But you got to know where to go, and I think angel investors are an ideal place to start. Um, individuals who have got a long horizon and perspective, and only once you've got amazing product market fit, you've really established your management team uh, that you'd even consider um, the, the prospect of taking venture capital that early. Just my advice. I have, a, I have two questions, actually. So the first one is, how did you identify that employers have a need for the product, um, that you'll find the perfect um, product market fit? And then my second question is, I just took a quick look at your website. You still kept the individual service. So I was wondering, since you mentioned that it was not so successful, um, why did you decide to keep it and still have the service running? No, good question, um, and I better change my website because we actually we haven't kept the individual service uh, running, um, but we do market. So it's a really interesting marketing campaign. Let me let me address your first question first. Employers and, and especially U.S. employers are really fascinating, and most a lot of Canadians don't necessarily get this distinction that any U.S. employer with 500 or more employees they self-insure, which means they are the insurance company. They take on the entire risk burden for their people. So they are the insurer, and then they hire an administrator that often looks like an insurance company to administer those benefits. But every dollar up or down um, that they can save or gain goes, hits their P&L. And so they make for a really interesting audience because they've got huge financial motivation, and as their costs are rising, as the costs in the US are, $3.6 trillion a year, 18% of GDP, mainly sick care. It's just taking care of sick people, no prevention. They can't afford for those seemingly healthy employees to cross over to chronic disease, just can't afford it. It will blow their P&L up. And so they've got big motivation to invest, and then there's a category that really innovate and will go and try all kinds of interesting things. They're not gonna stick with it forever, but US employers are probably the hotbed of most of the innovation taking place uh, in North America right now. Um, and two, the really interesting thing about working on a B2B to E model is that we've got two marketing campaigns that we're running. Consider, we sell to employers, and what we're selling to them are economic rationale, why they should be making this investment for this category of employees, happens to be about 50 to 60% of their people, um, and what the ROI looks like and what the metrics look like. That's one side of our um, website. But then the other is, that's really just getting permission to then turn around and offer that to the 50 to 60% of at-risk individuals who don't give a hoot about whether the company saves money, whether there's an ROI. All they care about is, is this gonna help me be my best self? And so what we're really trying to do is once we get to a company, we're trying to give the perspective of why should the benefits and HR and rewards leader care, and why should then the individual care? And that's what's represented there. I guess Tom Kaur, tr truly, a f you're a truly fabulous storyteller. Uh, th 
Uh, Thanks. Going, looking at your Newtopia story, to me, you painted this picture of constant pivoting and constant cash burn, maybe constant failure. I had more hair. <laughs> but you somehow made it here. I, I, how, did, how did you find investors that would just, and why do they keep pumping money in to keep you going after what seemed like a very, very rough and troublesome journey? I mean, you, you can ask one of my investors um, who's sitting there, but I, I, <laughs> Rick could take that. I, look, I, I, think I'm, I think I'm fairly blessed to have been, uh, to have identified a really group of patients individuals, but I think at the end of the day, what they saw in me was I just wasn't going to give up. Uh, in any adversity, I was going to figure a way around. If there was a wall, I was going to go around it, and I have. Uh, and so, and I really think that's, um, that's what angel investing is in the early days. We've raised about $40 million to date at Newtopia. The first 15 was all angel. That's a lot of angel money, uh, but it was all, you know, uh, you know much more long, patient, uh, and finding those right individuals, then the rest has been institutional. Also, long in this, this Go Public event is an opportunity to finally get some liquidity for those investors and continue to grow. But I really, I think at the end of the day, it's the jockey, um, and they were investing in me. I take that incredibly seriously, um, and also have done everything I can uh, not to let them down or to let the opportunity down. Hello. Um, so you talked uh, just a second about how you're, you're going directly to the enterprise and they're buying the, um, your product, but how do you actually get the employees, the at-risk employees of those companies to participate in the program? I work for TELUS Health and we do, um, we pilot all of our director consumer stuff on our own employees. and I, I feel like it's really, really difficult to actually get people mm. to use it. That's a really great question, and, and there's a lot of lessons learned there as well. I, I, what we found to be the best formula is to get, is really to try to get the timing right. Uh, oftentimes, benefits get rolled out on this annualized basis. You get a book of what's available, and no one pays attention or, quite frankly, cares because you don't have the timing right of when you know, matching that moment of opportunity with that moment of concern. And so what we do is we target the 50 to 60 percent of at-risk employees with elevated you know, waist circumference, blood pressure, blood sugar. But they generally learn about that through some kind of health risk assessment, whether it's a biometric test or an HRA or some kind of claims data analysis. And what we're doing is when those results come back and people learn that they're at a higher chance of having a heart attack or a stroke or diabetes, Generally, that happens um, you know, more in the U.S. than it does here, those reports. We want to strike then with that, uh-oh, with this moment of opportunity, which is, you know, hey, we understand you're at risk. Here's a program paid for by your employer, powered by Newtopia, to address all of those issues and provide some relief. We typically are seeing somewhere in the range of 30% of those at-risk individuals are taking us up on it on the first email. And so timing and context is really, really important, as opposed to the typical we're rolling out all this stuff on January the 1st. You're all thinking about your New Year's resolution. You've forgotten totally about your benefits package. And then somehow, when that moment of concern comes up, you're hoping that they're going to remember to go back to that booklet. It's nonsense. It won't work. And by the way, we've tried it, and we've failed miserably. So timing is the way to do it. Hi. Hi. Um, in 1911, the state of California attempted to introduce health care for its uh, state citizens. And the opposition were the insurance companies who successfully lobbied and killed it. Mm -hmm. I only give that as a brief American example because what you're talking about, preventative medicine, really should be the state which should regulate that people must monitor their own health care by law. And the technology, et cetera, is there now. So my question is that irrespective of monetized medicine and all of that arguments and controversy, you're trying to market preventative medicine as a huge and very vital aspect of society. Forget I'm Canadian, which I am. I would say universally people should be monitoring their own health care. And why should for-profit companies try to corner the market when the state and society should be in the leadership and the medical profession, 
should be leading the charge, not commercial for profit companies. Well, so first I'd say amen to the idea of the state introducing it. I'd say, unfortunately, um, we are so, we're, we're busy creating infrastructural changes and super agencies on sick care. No one's focused on prevention here. No conversation in the US focused on Bernie's Medicare for all and Trump's blow up the Affordable Care Act. There's no conversation of prevention going on. So shame on our elected officials and government bodies on both sides of the border, and I'd be happy to have that conversation, but they're not doing it. So in the absence of that and that abdication, then just go where the economics are. And that's all, you just follow the money. And employers have a huge economic, trust me, they're not, they're not investing in disease prevention because it's a nice thing to do. Uh, they, they don't care. Uh, and nor should they in a capitalistic uh, system. But if you understand what motivates them, what you can affect is pretty much prevention at scale where you have an economic actor investing. By the way, that could be CMS, Medicare or Medicaid, and Medicare is heading in that direction. Our customers should be the provincial health authorities across Canada. That's who would save the money. That's who got the, the meaningful. And again, once we get to Vegas, hopefully that opportunity will open up. But if you're a if you're a health startup trying to get the government to fund something, you're in desperate trouble because you're going to run out of money and you're never going to succeed. So at the end of the day, find an economic actor who's got the motivation, which they do. But it also happens to be required because the consumer is never going to pay for it. So you need to have the insurer, public or private, and again, employers are effectively just insurers, investing on behalf of a group of individuals who've got motivation to make a change. And, and now you can have preventive impact on millions of individuals. Right or wrong, it's working, it's what we're doing, and, and we plan to take advantage of it. Uh, you've made a, uh, an impressive and very inspiring uh, oh, introduction at the beginning. Uh, nice thesis. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about your business model? Uh, which perspective like do you no. want? <laughs> Pardon? Sounds like no. Well, I can, I can tell you about the business model because it, it works and it's been justified. You know, it's been working for six years and we're, we'll be profitable next year. So I have one. Uh, what would you like to know about it? Uh, That's just a broad question. Here, I, I think I'll answer it because it, it sounds like we're going to get stuck on that. And so here's the business model. We go out as a value-based provider to employers. The way that we work today is we want to put some skin in the game and not just be a vendor who's because you know, the way benefits have worked, and they still work in Canada largely, is that there's this per member per month capitated approach, which is we're going to take your entire benefit program and we're going to charge you from cents to dollars per head. And then the vendor is going to cross their fingers and hope no one shows up because their economic incentive is for no one to come. By the way, it's the same economic incentive that gyms have. It's the same economic that anyone who's capitating across that. They don't want people to come. In fact, if everyone came, it would blow up their business model uh, entirely. So we decided we wanted to go value-based. And so what we do is we put skin in the game and we charge on a per-engaged participant per month basis with an, an outcome guarantee guaranteeing our outcomes. And so the way we charge is every month that a participant is engaged with Newtopia, leveraging their inspirator, which is, are our coaches, or leveraging our technology platform, there's a monthly fee, but there's a high bar. So if someone's engaged, then we charge. If someone isn't, then we don't. And so the onus is on us to be really good at engaging or else we literally don't generate any revenue. But even then, that engagement must lead to an outcome at the end of 12 months. So if we achieve a 5% or greater body weight reduction, which will trigger improvement on all five metabolic risk factors, we charge an outcome fee. Effectively, it's a success fee, a balloon payment. There we know that if we've done our job well, not only have we engaged the population, but we've driven a successful outcome, and everyone wins in that circumstance. We, we know from our clinical results that the individual wins by having improved all five of their risks and preventing the onset of those conditions. We know that the employer who's investing wins by saving uh, what is uh, just shy of $1,500 in paid medical costs and driving a 2x in your ROI, and we win because most of our margin is lumped at that success fee. And so our business model is really an alignment model. We really want to be as value-based as we can. Quite frankly, what I'd like to do is participate in the upside. I'd like to be pure value, participate in the gain share, having quite, no one's there yet. Um, but at the end of the day, that's where we want to be, and that's how our model works, and it's how we've been able to attract the clientele that we have, because they see that we're serious about it. 
So thank you very much. I think it was very inspirational what you had to say. Um, I come from a different angle. I'm not looking to... I'm from the non-for-profit world. I work with Margin Times Canada. Cool. So one of the things you haven't really spoke about is, did you, do you see a connection between your innovation and what you're doing, and how can working with non-for-profits uh, support what you do? We see thousands of people that have had, you know, Margin Times serves people with physical disabilities. Again, does that work for people with chronic conditions? Um, how do you engage? We have a platform of people that would be very interested. So where, where do you see that as a relationship? Yeah, I, I'm so not opposed and, and uh, have a giant amount of respect for the not-for-profit sector. Just, so I'm a, I'm a startup entrepreneur. I've got investors. I have expectations of the cash I've raised to the revenues I generate. And so we've just, we're forced, uh, and other entrepreneurs are forced to figure out how to monetize to justify the cash that comes in and generate a return or else it doesn't work. Um, and so we're still in that cycle, which is why the whole for-profit motivation works. But I would say to partner with the not-for-profit sector and to identify uh, individuals who are at risk, who you know many of, that as long as there's a funding mechanism, somehow, someone has to pay for this. Uh, and so that's all we, are, we need to identify is where is the payer coming from? Is it coming from whoever's funding the not-for-profit? Is it coming from government or private? Uh, but that, that's, that's our only trick and why we haven't um, been, I don't think we've sought out to date or necessarily been successful in identifying where does Newtopia get paid to generate the outcomes on the other end? And that's, that's the, just the God honest truth. Hi. Hi. Uh, people are generally, um reluctant to uh, trust employers and governments, for that matter, with their healthcare data. And I was just wondering, have you come across privacy concerns on the part of individuals uh, working for such companies that, that have your product? And, and if so, uh, how have you addressed those privacy, privacy concerns? No, it's a, it's, a, it's a really important question and also consider, so we are collecting some incredibly sensitive information. We collect genetic information profile, behavioral profile and social profile on each of our individuals. In fact, it's what makes us successful in getting to know people. But by that same token, um, that's a lot of information being shared. And so, and, and also we are probably the first mass market genetic uh, program being endorsed by US employers. So for an Aetna and a JP Morgan and Accenture to take us out to hundreds of thousands of people advocating they take a genetic test, that's a pretty remarkable thing. And so I think it gives a sense of just where precision health and genomics has come. Because when we started this 10 years ago, unheard of. Um, even five years ago when we started selling in the States, unheard of. But the one thing I would say is um, what the U.S. also has that we need that isn't present here is something called Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA laws. Uh, unfortunately, Canada doesn't have them in place. It's why there's been a relative chill on any precision health or medicine, because until the Supreme Court finishes its review and, and enacts that legislation, there is no bright line between what an employer, insurer, government can do with that data or not. So therefore, nothing's happening, or very little. But in the U.S., GINA laws are robust. And so it means that employers and insurers cannot ask us, and nor do they. It's like the third rail. They want nothing to do with that data um, because it would, it would be a gross violation, uh, you know, almost like a HIPAA violation, and they just want to stay away from it. So we don't have a, an issue there. We are very upfront with our participants what we're doing with that data and what we're not in informed consent. And we share and we, you know, we, we want to make sure what we're doing and our intentions are very clear. But the one thing I would say is we found a yearning, almost a please build something personal for us. Um, don't give us another generic guideline. Don't give us just another recommendation. And what they see in the genomics is the opportunity to really learn about them and to really design something that's going to be about them. And so we have an over 90% uptake uh, of the genetic testing. Not that there's no privacy concern, uh, but I think the desire for something that's really going to work is outweighing the concern that we're not going to be able to figure out how to encrypt, secure, and hold that data private. Hi. Hi. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, I just want you to talk a little bit about your motivation uh, from your father. Uh, I'm a startup myself, and my mother developed cancer, and so I have built a medical device for cancer after effects. Mm -hmm. But how has that driven you over the decades, literally? And is that what you keep drawing upon to give you the strength? Yeah, I mean, um, 
So th there's no question, you know, back to that passion, I mean, it's almost really simple. I wake up every day trying to design something that had my dad had it, he'd still be here, and I fundamentally believe he would, and that I didn't know the answer to when I sat in that doctor's appointment, that I now understand it. And so it's selfish, but I'm building something for my dad, I'm building something for me that happens to have a benefit for millions of people who are at risk. Hmm? Um, Jeff, my name is Sanjay. I'm an MBA student from uh, U of T. I'm inspired by your, your career journey. I, 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 re uh, I really like how you made this business. What I'm thinking is, uh, how does wellness get disrupted by the artificial intelligence technology coming in, yeah. and how is Neutopia looking into it? Yeah, so we're, I mean, we're kind of all over it um, right now, and, and I, think, I think, I don't think it necessarily gets disrupted, um, and in fact, I think this wellness well-being is the perfect intersection of what humans can do that innately only humans can do, which is love and care and empathize, and what AI can do, which is take all of the administrative algorithmic crap out of the human and, and superpower that relationship. And so what we really are looking at and investing in today um, with partnerships uh, with AI leaders and attracting some world-class AI talent is how can we have AI uh, and leverage that to really empower and um, let the human being in the relationship do what only they can do and have the smart platform do what it can do. Um, I should also say, you know, the other fascinating part of Newtopia is we're sitting on this incredibly valuable data set. Consider that um, for every participant, we collect their entire genomic sample, which we have absolute permission rights to look at the entire genomic and exome sequence. And three plus years of all the lifestyle data, that's phenotypic data, that we can longitudinally connect. And so talk about treasure trove of data sets. One, those two things don't come together very often. You have the genomic databases sitting here, phenotypic databases sitting here. Never do they generally come together. Um, big interest in the opportunity to layer deep learning into what insights can we glean to improve our predictive analytics and our opportunity to offer uh, better advice to our participants. But also, when you consider the true economic value of Newtopia, I believe it's going to be in collecting a big enough data set that we start to partner with pharma and drug discover discovery and together come up with the next generation of predictive therapeutics, uh, preventive therapeutics, excuse me, and that's ultimately uh, where we're driving. So there's a story under the story, and, and AI has a, a big role in it. But I don't fear, and I don't think we should, in health, fear AI as taking away from anything. I think it's going to serve as a beautiful adjunct to help the human, whether it's the doctor, the coach, the wellness professional, do what only they can do, and ultimately take away a lot of the administrative hassle um, that ultimately algorithms are going to kick our butt at. Uh, Jeff, the last question is right here. Uh, hello, so Hi. thank you for sharing your story and for your transparency. My husband, who is an entrepreneur, will agree with you about Canada and innovation. I will just um, add perhaps one of the key successes is, will be your wife, your lovely and understanding wife. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, my question is, um, uh, do you take GMO into consideration, G GMO? G uh, Oh, excuse me. Oh, uh, was, into yes. consideration in your weight loss program because we know that the quality of food has an impact on health. Yeah, uh, no question. So, I mean, uh, I should say Newtopia literally stands for the right combination of nutrition plus exercise plus mental and behavioral well-being. So we have a deep understanding and uh, advice that we're providing across each of those respects on lifestyle management. I, I wouldn't say that we particularly have taken a position or opinion on GMOs specifically uh, in, in terms of going that detail. I have my own opinions, but that's not necessarily a Newtopia opinion. Um, but we are certainly, what we're really trying to do is um, meet people where they are along their journey toward better health and then provide them with the right incremental steps in nutrition, in exercise, in mental and behavioral health to develop new healthy habits, most importantly confidence to be able to drive those forward and do more learning, you know, more understanding. And so ultimately uh, it may not be the first thing that we, uh, you know, oftentimes we're meeting individuals um, you know, who, who literally uh, haven't put any of the pieces together. So, uh, you know, GMO component may not be the first thing that we draw on, but certainly as we get down the road and their curiosity and confidence grows, then it certainly would be something that we get into with our participants. Okay, so Jeff, I want to thank you for being so open 
and transparent about your story because I know there's ups and downs and also to demonstrate the passion that you have for this journey that you're on. So everyone, please, a uh, uh, round of applause. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. I uh, apologize we could not get to all the questions. I think Jeff might have a little time to interact. If we do that, could we do it just outside the, the glass doors? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.